human origins. 10 million years ago in the forests of Africa, the first glimmer of human life on this earth. From this evolutionary accident, the world is today painted in a rainbow of peoples and cultures. The Celtic fringe on the shores of the Atlantic. Nomads of the Sinai. Africans, Asians, Native Americans, the Aborigines of Australia. This series is about where all of us come from, why we differ from our cousins, the apes, and how step by step, we have scratched and clawed our way from our origins in the wilderness to create civilizations and ideas that have lasted for centuries. Ten thousand years ago, the human race numbered a mere five million. Since then, we have multiplied a thousandfold. With this population explosion has come a flourishing of the arts. A multitude of splendid cities and monuments. The triumphs of science and technology. and the conquest of space. Roger, uh, America. Have a good bird. You're loud clear. But civilization is also a story of war and destruction. The arts of war have kept pace with the arts of peace. Man's inhumanity is part of the human story we will tell. From the dawn of civilization in ancient Mesopotamia to the massacres and holocausts of our own day. Moving back in time from images of the world about us today, we will summon up memories from previous eras the artifacts and relics left behind by men and women in earlier times. We'll see how the great forces of history have helped to shape and determine the world we inhabit today. To begin with, we must look at the origins of mankind and how we resemble and differ from our animal predecessors. The evolution of the human species is long, complicated, and in places, obscure. All we have to go on are scattered human fossils found by archaeologists and anthropologists in wild, remote locations. We belong to a subspecies called Homo sapiens sapiens which represents a division of the species known as Homo sapiens, or thinking man. The origins go back at least 10 million years to the jungles of equatorial Africa. It was then that mankind's early ancestors ape-like creatures with large jaws and powerful arms and hands descended from the trees to the open grasslands and walked on two feet. From that time forward, apes and hominids, human-like creatures, split apart. The apes remained arboreal, spending much of their time in the trees. But by five or six million years ago, the hominids became what we call bipedal, 
traveling upright on two feet. Why they left the trees and took to the ground, we can only surmise. Presumably, it was in search of new, untapped sources of food, and the fact that the forest cover itself was retreating. But the main lines of evolution following on from this development are clear enough. First of all, the pelvis and legs had to be adapted to traveling upright. Secondly, the arms and hands, now that they were no longer needed for walking, became free for other purposes, for hunting and food gathering and for making tools and weapons. As a consequence, there were dramatic changes in physiology. The jaw and snout, no longer needed to seek out and chew raw food, became less prominent. At the same time, the brain cavity grew larger and changed shape. The earliest of the primitive hominids had a brain capacity of only 500 cubic centimeters or so, not much different from that of a modern ape. About one and a half million years ago, with the appearance of Homo erectus, upright man, brain size had increased to a thousand cubic centimeters and sometimes more. About some 50,000 years ago, a new animal began to roam the Earth. His skeletal remains are indistinguishable in any way from those of modern man, and his brain had attained today's average of 1,500 cubic centimeters. Over time, differences have developed in skin color and a few other minor features have changed in response to different climates and environments. This is the origin of the so-called human races, such as Mongols, Caucasians, and Negroes. But there have been no major transformations in man's bodily structure or in his mental capacity. The principal phase of evolutionary adjustment was over. In human evolution, the decisive factor has been the development of the brain. Homo sapiens were the first creatures on the earth to specialize in mental rather than physical power. Those unique mental abilities account for our inventiveness, our capacity for learning, communication, and cooperative action. And above all, for the adaptability that enabled men and women to spread from their original homeland in Africa, across Asia and Europe, and into the Americas and Australia. The World, a television history, will continue on TLC. In the beginning, our human ancestors were scavengers and meat eaters. At a remarkably early stage, perhaps as many as two million years ago, stones and pebbles were used in the hunting of small animals. These first weapons were crude and primitive. But early man learned to shape and fashion the stones into sharp instruments, hand axes, choppers, scrapers, blades, and ultimately, pointed arrowheads. Today, looking at these artifacts, the differences seem tiny, but they are of fundamental importance. They mark the birth of man the toolmaker, using tools to supplement his natural endowment, his hands and feet. Toolmaking is one of the distinctive qualities of the human being. This demonstration illustrates the long and skillful process needed to turn a piece of flint into a sharpened blade. By the time Homo sapiens sapiens appeared on the scene, he was using bone, reindeer antler, and mammoth ivory for his implements, as well as stone. Simple as they were, these tools were the first stage in human technology. The immediate practical result was to enable early man to hunt larger animals, the mammoth, rhinoceros, the saber-toothed tiger, and the sibertherium. These were the creatures that inhabited the world of early man. Many of the animals were more fleet of foot. Many were more powerful and agile. But it was man's intelligence that enabled him to prevail. 
After tools, the second most important of early man's discoveries was fire. It enabled men and women to live in harsh, cold climates and to survive icy winters. Man harnessed the secret of fire very early. Traces of the use of fire in ancient Kenya might be up to one and a half million years old. As mankind spread into the temperate areas, fire was doubtlessly an essential tool, and traces of hearths 400,000 years old have been found as far afield as Britain, Hungary, and in caves near Beijing, China. This museum reconstruction of a cave hearth shows the layer of ash from burnt out fires left over from nearly a half a million years ago. The first hominids were subtropical or equatorial creatures, adapted for life in the hot jungle and unable to extend their range far beyond the warm African grasslands. Without the control of fire, men and women could not live outside the tropical belt. It was the knowledge of fire, along with warm clothing made from animal skins, that enabled people to survive the Great Ice Age. Temperatures then averaged 20 to 25 degrees lower than today. The Ice Age began over two million years ago and played a decisive part in early human history. Glacial periods were separated by warm interglacial spans of time. And all continents experienced variations of heat and cold, rain and drought, far more extreme than anything recorded in recent centuries. Large areas of the Northern Hemisphere in America, as well as in Europe and Asia, were covered for long periods with impenetrable ice sheets, uninhabitable not only by humans, but by most other animals as well. The last phase of glaciation began 75,000 years ago, and as long as it continued, men and women could, at best, eke out a tenuous existence on the margins of the ice fields. The advance of the ice sheets had other important consequences. While the intense cold persisted, huge quantities of water were frozen, and the sea levels dropped precipitously. Land bridges appeared, linking many continental areas with isolated islands. Southeast Asia was one large land mass, with modern-day Indonesia, Malaysia, and Borneo all linked to Vietnam. A land bridge from Korea made possible the colonization of Japan. Further north, a similar land bridge across what is now the Bering Strait connected Eastern Asia to Alaska. There was an enormous exchange of animals between Asia and the Americas. To the west, the British Isles were linked to the continent of Europe, and ice sheets connected Scandinavia with the northeastern European plains. The Ice Age ended some 10,000 years ago, when the ice began to recede. As the Earth warmed, the huge ice sheets melted, unleashing vast quantities of water. Sea levels rose dramatically and the outline of the continents familiar to us today began to emerge. By this time, the human beings had shown their ability to adapt to different environments and climates, and the population began to grow at a faster rate. Warmer conditions affected plant life first, then animal life, and finally human life. As the ice fields melted and shrank, the mammoths and reindeer who browsed on the sparse subarctic vegetation, lichens and mosses of the frozen plains or tundra, shifted northwards. Hunters followed on their trail. Further south, the icy plains gave way to rich grasslands, and forests of spruce, aspen, and birch sprang up, providing homes and food for other species.
Virtually all of Canada had been covered in ice. When it melted, a corridor opened east of the Rockies. Mongol hunters, trekking from Siberia and Alaska, passed into the game lands of the American plains and quickly advanced through Panama into South America. By 8,000 BC, humans had traversed the whole of the American continent and reached Tierra del Fuego at its most southern tip. People penetrated not only to new parts of the continents where they had long been at home, like Africa and Asia and Europe, but also to new continents like Australia and the Americas. Mankind was now well on the way to becoming the most widespread animal in the world. The World, a television history, will continue on TLC. Ten thousand years ago, mankind was poised for further progress. Future history would be human history. One reason for this progress was that men and women had also advanced socially, learning to cooperate in the struggle for existence. Individuals and their families may have been able to trap and kill small animals and gather simple foods. But the hunting of the larger animals required organization and cooperative effort. The early hunters may seem primitive, as the few remaining hunters like these of the Amazon jungles of Brazil do today. But a study of these surviving hunting societies is a rich source for understanding how the communities of early man must have functioned. A sophisticated and complex tribal code is revealed as these hunters track down and stalk their prey. The hunters of 10,000 years ago had already reached a cultural level which put them far ahead of all other primates. The clearest evidence of this cultural advance are the rock paintings left behind by early man. This cave art, some of it reaching back 30,000 years, is a remarkable tribute both to the artistic ability and to the imaginative powers of our human ancestors. So remarkable that for a long time, the paintings were written off as modern frauds. The subject matter of many of the paintings is dominated by animals, a natural obsession for hunting communities. But much cave art suggests a more mystical significance, like the outline of these hands, thought to be some form of hunting ritual. Quite possibly, many of these paintings, often found in the most inaccessible recesses of the cave, were designed as the background for religious ceremonies, with the priest or sorcerer performing magic rites to ensure success in the hunt. There were other cults as well, like the fertility cults, represented by female figures with exaggerated sexual characteristics. Already by this time, men and women were burying their dead, sometimes alone, and sometimes in communal graves, indicating that they might have shared a belief in the afterlife. All this indicates clearly enough the cultural strides which early man had made. Some parts of the world, like the open steppes and prairies, which were still teeming with game of many varieties, could continue to support rich hunting. But by 9,000 BC, climatic changes restricted the numbers of game and the possibilities for hunting. In Europe and in the relatively dry climate of the Near East, people began to eat a much wider range of foodstuffs. Nuts, seeds, and shellfish were probably acquired by the women gathering, while some men would have hunted forest animals but such resources were inherently limited. Climatic change, a continuously growing population, and improved hunting techniques contributed dramatically to the depletion of previously rich sources of food. 
In America, within a thousand years of mankind's arrival, the horse had perished forever until its reintroduction from Europe in the 16th century. As life became harder for the hunting and gathering groups, men and women had to adapt, creating a new diversity of ways of life on Earth. One such innovation had massive consequences. Somewhere around 8,000 BC in the mountains of the Near East, men and women began to select, breed, domesticate and cultivate various species of plant and animal. Homo sapiens were now poised to move from their primitive origins to a new phase of human history, the agricultural revolution and the dawn of urban civilization. <laughs> 